Hey YouTube, this is Ian from Big Rock ADV. So what I'm going to bring to you today is a buyer's guide for the BMW R1200 and 1250GS. So the reason I'm making this video is because I get a lot of questions about someone who's looking at a used 1200GS and they're wondering about what are all the differences between the different years and what should they look for, what's a good value, what are things to watch out for in certain years, and all the things like that. So what I've done is I've taken a look at all the model years of the GS starting in 2005 going all the way up to 2020 and we're going to break this down for you in detail. So if you're in the market for a 1200GS, this is the video for you. Okay, so the reason I'm starting in 2005, I know the GS goes way back beyond that, but in order to keep this video to a reasonable length and to provide the most information for the average person who's looking at one of these used bikes, uh, I had to stop somewhere. So I'm, I'm gonna go back to 2005 and cover from then to the present in terms of the features and specs. Now, even though I'm not gonna go into detail on the old GSs because we just don't have time and most of you shopping are looking at the newer ones, I do wanna cover real quickly the history of the GS because it's such an important motorcycle and in the history of motorcycles and, and for BMW especially. So the GS can trace its roots back to the late 70s and BMW released the R80G S in 1980. People really didn't know what to make of this bike. It was kind of the first of its kind. So back then, the idea of a travel enduro or adventure touring really didn't exist. You had dirt bikes and you had street bikes. So here comes BMW with the shaft-driven um, motorcycle with a opposed twin cylinder engine, had long travel suspension. People really didn't know what to think of it and the reviews weren't that great. Trying to make a long story short, um, people started to get the idea of the bike. The bike also came to notoriety because there's some riders who rode it to success in races like the Paris Dakar and other races like the Six Days. I think through those races, the public took notice of this bike and said, oh, this is actually something we should pay attention to. Also, as people started to ride it, they realized that it kind of took the, the qualities of a street bike or a touring bike, the comfort, the versatility, the touring ability, and added in some off-road ability, even though it wasn't quite a dirt bike. So the GS continued to gain popularity through the 80s. Of course, they came out with models like the Paris Dakar model and things like that. So you started to see the introduction of the large fuel tanks, the engine guards, the fancy color schemes. And those bikes are really valuable today if you have one. <laughs> they did eventually introduce an R100G slash Ash, which had 60 horsepower versus 50 horsepower on the 80. 1993 saw the R1100GS come out. The 1100GS was a whole new bike um, and really represented bringing the GS more into the modern world. You had things like fuel injection, you had a larger engine, you had more power, you had more features. But also I do want to note that that's when the GS really started to gain weight and that's going to be a trend that we're going to talk about during this video. 1999 saw the introduction of the 1150GS which was just kind of an evolution of the 1100. They punched out the engine, gave it more power, added some features. During this time, in the late 90s, BMW also wanted to expand the GS line, so they brought out single cylinder GSs, the 650s. Later on, they had the 650 Dakar. They had some silly looking thing called like the Funduro or something like that. In 2002, uh, as these bikes were getting more popular, they introduced the Adventure model. So the Adventure model was kind of an evolution of the Perry Dakar model, and what it had was a large tank, um, you know, luggage racks, uh, crash bars came with it, things like that. This bike really became famous because, and that really brings us to 2005 where I'm going to start off the details and specs in this video and getting into the buyer's guide. So 2005, BMW completely redesigned the GS. Another thing that comes up when looking at the history of the GS is why do they use this boxer engine? You know, it looks kind of silly, people don't really understand it sometimes. The Boxer engine is a part of BMW's history, going back to the first motorcycle they ever had. So the first motorcycle was, they used the Boxer twin engine and it became a hallmark for them and they still haven't given it up. There are some advantages to it, the advantages being it tends to produce fairly good torque, it keeps the weight uh, lower in the bike because it, it pushes the mass down. Um, the other advantage that I find to it, especially on these GSs, is that when you tip them over, they don't fall all the way over. You've got to have an engine bar so you don't damage the case itself, 
but that's kind of a nice thing, much easier to pick up. But it is true that a boxer engine or an opposed twin engine is really not a very efficient design for making power. Um, this can be proven by the point that you know there's a lot of adventure bikes or other street bikes that run a 1,000cc engine or a 1,200cc engine and produce far more power than the GS does. They've actually had to introduce the shift cam technology trying to keep up in the horsepower wars with KTM and the other manufacturers. This can also be proven by BMW's own motorcycles. They have things like the, the 1,000cc inline four engine that produces something like over 200 horsepower, yet you have a modern a boxer engine and they're, they're working very, very hard to get 134 horsepower out of a 1250. So that pretty much settles that. But do you want an inline four engine in your adventure bike? Probably not. I tend to think that the boxer actually makes a great engine for an adventure bike, but it's not the most efficient design ever. So we just have to live with that. So I mentioned I'm going to start in 2005. The, I'm not going to talk about the singles, I'm not going to talk about the 650s, and I'm not going to get into the 800s or the 700s or those. Um, the reason is that I don't want to make the video too long, and I'm just going to cover the Boxer Twin GSs. If you guys want to have a video on you know, the parallel twins and the history of those and, and a buyer's guide to that, let me know in the comments. I'll be happy to create one for you. Just real quickly on the 800s, the main differences were between the 800 and the 1200 is that the 800 is going to be a parallel twin engine, it's going to have a chain drive, it's going to be a smaller, lighter weight bike, it's not going to have the advanced electronics of the 1200, at least not until they introduced the 850 which just came out, but that's a separate topic. Um, the 800 is a little more off-road focused and it's not as good on the road. Okay, so let's jump in and get to the heart of this. So, so in 2005, BMW took the 1150 GS, which was getting a little bit long in the tooth with that design dating back kind of to 1993, kind of a heavy bike, kind of clunky, and they brought out this new bike for 2005. It was a complete redesign over the 1150, didn't share any parts. The big thing about the 2005 redesign and going to the 1200 and the so-called hex head engine is that they dropped 66 pounds or around 30 kilograms from the bike. That is a huge weight loss for a bike. How many other bikes do you know that they're redesigned and they lose over 60 pounds? That's really a great achievement by BMW. Now, on the other hand, we're gonna talk about how over the years since then, they've gone the opposite direction, which is kind of a problem. Uh, the 1200, of course, because it was a new engine, it had more power, had more torque, it was smoother, it was more refined, it had better handling. Um, everything was new about it. So the 05, 06, 07 bikes were basically the same with a few tiny changes that we don't need to go into. Uh, the things to watch for on those 05s through 07s, now I know they're going to be the, the lowest priced ones, but there's some reasons for that. Number one, they're old, they're the oldest, but also they had something called a servo ABS brake. And what the servo is, it's basically just a power, un a power brake unit that um, uses electricity to, uh, to generate more hydraulic pressure. The BMW's ideas idea with this was that, oh, we're going to give you, you're barely going to have to touch the lever and you're going to have all this brake power. And that was true. You could basically breathe on the lever and have a ton of brakes, but a lot of people didn't like the feel of it. Personally, I didn't like the feel of it either. Uh, but the really big problem with the servos was that uh, the servo motor was a very expensive part, something like $1,500 to $2,000 if you have to buy it from BMW. And it's something that would fail fairly often. So if you're buying an 0507, um, just really beware and ask the owner if they've, if they've had to replace that servo motor. Um, the way to avoid this problem is probably flushing the brake system very, very often. Uh, hydraulic brake fluid is, is hygroscopic. And hygroscopic means that it absorbs water into it. You got to change your brake fluid no matter what bike you have, but even more so on those servo bikes. Other things to watch out for, um, and this is going to be a hallmark with most of the GSs really and most BMWs on the boxers, is that the transmissions are kind of clunky. Um, also, you're looking at a dry clutch. Uh, they, they continue the dry clutch all the way to the water-cooled bikes, and we're going to talk about that. But the thing with the dry clutch is that um, the way the clutch was arranged in the motorcycle all the way to 2013, so all the oil-cooled bikes, um, it was very difficult to change out the clutch. Very expensive job. You have to take a lot of the engine apart. The other problem with a dry clutch is that it doesn't have the greatest um, linear feel to it, and plus it's more prone to overheating. Now there's a lot of riders who say, oh, it's fine, you know, they never have a problem with it and they ride it all over the world, and maybe that's true, but if I'm given the choice between a wet clutch and a dry clutch, I'm not going to want a dry clutch. A wet clutch is more modern, uh, it's more resistant to heating, to heat and to fading, um, and you don't really want the dry clutch, but that's something you've got to factor in when you're looking at these oil-cooled bikes. Okay, so moving on. 2008, BMW did an update to the GS. This was an important update for a few reasons. 
Uh, the bike got a hotter camshaft and increased compression. Um, the red line went up from 7750 to 8000 RPM and you got five more horsepower. So that felt a little bit more powerful. Um, torque was unchanged. Um, so that's a change to the engine, a little bit more modern. Uh, the other big changes on the 08, which were a big deal for some people is you had the introduction of uh, BMW's ESA, or some people call it ESA, electronic suspension adjustment. Um, for 2008, back then, I mean, that was 12 years ago, they didn't have things like dynamic ESA. So the ESA they had then was a ride height adjustment depending on the weight, but you had to, you had to tell the computer um, how many riders you had. You could also adjust the damping from like hard, medium, soft, something like that. So um, is, you know, one of the first uh, adventure bikes, I guess, was the first adventure bike to have electronic suspension way back in 2008. They also introduced something called ASC, automatic slip control, which is just a form of traction control. And back in 08, when those bikes had this ASC, it was a very crude system. I think the 800 actually carried that all the way to like 2015 or something or 16 or whatever it was. Um, pretty crude traction control. I don't think it was really adjustable. You either had to turn it on or off. Uh, I remember I had a test bike, an 08 um, GS, and I, I hated that ASC because it really had no adjustability on it. You, you just had to turn it off if you went in the dirt. Uh, the other change that 2008 had was that they, they steepened the, the, the steering rake. So it went from uh, like around 27 degrees to 25 degrees. What that meant was that they were trying to make it steer sharper um, for the street so it, it handled more nimble on the street. Um, however, that does tend to make a bike a little bit more unstable off-road and things like sand. So, you know, something to factor in. Uh, things to watch for on the 08s and 09s. They were a big improvement on the 05 to 07. You still got the, kind of the clunky gearbox. Uh, the, the big deal with the, the 08s was getting rid of the servo brakes. So they no longer had the servo motor, they just had normal ABS brakes. Uh, BMW uses Brembo brakes and they're extremely strong. You don't need the power brakes. So it was a great thing that that went away. Um, so if, you, if your budget can afford it, go for the 08 um, and later versus the 05 to 07. That's my opinion. Okay, moving on again. So in 2010, uh, two years later their last up, from their last update, BMW said, okay, we're going to um, improve the GS again. Uh, what they did in 2010 was they changed the head design of the motor. They went to a double overhead camshaft. We don't need to get into all the technical part of that, uh, but basically double overhead cam allowed them to make the engine a little bit sportier, give it more power, give it a higher red line. You can kind of start to sense this, this thing with the GS that they're always chasing a little bit more power, right? Um, which I guess is a good thing for the way most people use the bike kind of as a sport tour. So the 2010 bike gained around five horsepower, gained around three torque, uh, and the red line went up to 8,500 um, from 8,000. So, you know, I've ridden the older, the uh, 09 and previous bikes uh, and the 2010 to 2012 oil-cooled bikes with the cam head, is what they call them, the cam head, because they have the double red camshaft. And there's a, there's a big difference in how the bike feels. It feels a lot sportier, a lot more athletic, sounds better. Um, so if you, again, if your budget can afford it, and this is gonna start to be a theme in this video, but if your budget can afford it, try to get a 10 to 12. If you'd like the oil-cooled, oil air cooled bikes of that era, um, try to get a 10 to 12 because that extra power is nice, it's, it's smoother, and it, and it just feels like a better motorcycle. They also put in a, a flap in the exhaust, which made it sound a little bit different too. Um, the only downside to moving to the double overhead camshaft was that now your valve adjustments are gonna be a little bit more complicated than before. Other thing to keep in mind is that if you're an oil air, if you're an oil head fan, if you if you like these oil cooled GSs, they were lighter than the water cooled bikes. We're going to talk about that. Then the 10 to 12 was the most advanced, fastest, and and really um, most well developed version of the oil head uh, GSs. Okay, we're getting into the modern era now. So in 2013, BMW introduced the liquid cooled bikes. Um, now, when you say water-cooled, it's really only partially water-cooled. It's something like less than 30% of the engine's actually liquid-cooled. Um, they had to introduce liquid cooling to get more power. So let's talk about this. So the 2013 bike was an entirely new motorcycle. It's just like what they did in 2005. They threw out the old design and basically started from scratch. They kept all the qualities of the GS that people have come to know and love, the boxer engine, the low center gravity, the versatility, the long travel suspension, but they brought it into the modern world. 
um, a ton of changes for the 2013, and it might be it might be the biggest sort of evolutionary or revolutionary in this case step that BMW ever took with the GS, in my opinion. So like I said, everything was new. You got the, the liquid cooled engine, the power went up 15 horsepower, and the torque went up by about four. They finally put in a wet clutch, thank God. You got away from the old clunky dry clutches of the past. Uh, the wet clutch is much easier to change out if you ever wear it out, and it just performs better off-road. 2013 saw the introduction of dynamic ESA. Dynamic ESA means that the suspension is sensing the road as you ride and adjusting the damping and preload as you go down the road. Um, great technology, and they were a leader in that back in 2013. You also saw the introduction of riding modes. So now the bike had like rain, road, sport, different things like that. And now the technology's evolved a little bit since then, uh, but the, the riding modes were really a first for the GS. And I think a good thing because a newer rider could ride in a rain mode and have a softer power delivery, whereas someone who was an aggressive rider could put it in Enduro or Enduro Pro and get a fast turn throttle. Uh, you also saw the introduction of cruise control. Cruise control is a huge deal, and I will never have another adventure bike without cruise control. For me, once you have it, you can't go back, but that's just my opinion. I should also mention the, uh, the, the riding modes, you get Enduro Pro mode, which starts to affect how your ABS works. So now, the old bikes, the ABS, when you went off-road, you just had to turn it off because it was dangerous. On the 2013 bikes, with the riding modes and the Enduro Pro and the ABS settings, uh, you can now have your front ABS still activated, but in Enduro mode, it turns off your rear ABS. So a big safety factor, a big, big improvement there with how you can control the ABS. Uh, they also added the adjustable windshield. Uh, the old bikes were adjustable for um, angle, but they didn't go up and down. Uh, the wind protection, the, the buffeting, and, and the overall adjustability on the 2013 and later bikes is a huge, huge improvement over the older bikes. I found to have a lot of buffeting with the older GSs. Um, and the 20, when, the 20, when I first rode a 2013, that's one of the first things I noticed was how much better the wind protection was. So they did a great job putting this thing through the wind tunnel. Uh, they also had a wider rims and tires on these liquid cool bikes. So they went from a 150 rear tire to a 170 and the front they went from a So things to watch for. So, so unlike in 2005 when they drop weight from the bike, uh, when they added the liquid cooling, they added the windshield, they added the electronics, they added all the fancy stuff, uh, they couldn't help but having the weight go up. So the weight went up. So the weight went up on the liquid-cooled bikes by around 20 pounds when they went from the oil-cooled bike to the liquid-cooled bike. Now for me, I think the 20 pounds is a worthwhile trade-off um, to get all those extra features that really make a huge difference in the comfort and usability of the bike. However, what I don't like is what we're gonna talk about is they keep kind of creeping up every time they change the bike. So we'll get to that. So we talked about the downside of the weight gain. The gearbox is still a little bit clunky um, on the 2013 to 2016 bikes. Uh, and you know, some people have noticed that also the liquid-cooled engine is not, doesn't love to be lugged as much as the old oil-cooled bikes. The oil-cooled fans say that they like how they can kind of chug really down low and, and still take off. The liquid-cooled bikes like a little bit more revs, but I still find it to be pretty good off the bottom myself. Okay, so fast forward to 2017. In 2017, BMW made a rolling change to the liquid cool GS. Now, I think in some countries, the changes took effect um, in the early 2017. In some countries, it might have been a little bit later. In the US, we tend to refer to these as 2017 and a half or 2017.5 bikes. But keep in, mind, um, the, keep in mind the nomenclature there. You can tell by the styling whether or not you're looking at uh, the older generation or the newer generation 1200. Um, the styling on the on the 2017.5 is different, especially in the fairing area. It doesn't have those kind of um, long pointy front fairings. So that's how you tell if you get these updates. Um, so what's new in 2017 and a half? So they had to update the bike to Euro 4 emission standards. Um, and that's a thing in Europe where they, they're trying to reduce the emissions of the motorcycles. So they had to like change the exhaust and try to make it cleaner. And in order, in the process of that and doing some other updates, the bike has gained weight again. So the bike gained about 10 pounds um, going to this Euro 4 compliant bike. 
So like I mentioned, the styling is different. Uh, it's the same styling of the 1250. So the 1250 and a uh, late model 1200, the 2017 and a half and 2018s look the same, except with the 1250 badge, the only thing being different. Um, a big change for the 2017 and a half GS was that the dynamic ESA is now generation two. So what they did, they updated the electronics package of the motorcycle. So now the ESA is, it's still dynamic ESA, but it has a load leveling sensor. So it senses the load on the bike and adjusts the ride height up and down. You can still set min and max. You can still have it low and high, but I always run mine in the auto setting and it just adjusts based on how much weight or luggage I'm carrying, which I really do like. Um, you also got some other electronic upgrades that were really important. You got hill start control. So if you hold the front brake, I think that's how you activate it. I did it by accident on mine. <laughs> um, if you like hold the front brake, it activates hill start control. What it does is that it basically holds the brakes on for you, which allows you to then take off without worrying about holding the brakes. I don't have a need for that feature, but some people like it. Um, you also got ABS Pro. ABS Pro uses sensors in the bike um, to sense the lean angle and it will adjust the ABS effect based on the lean angle. That's a big safety feature. And what it really means for you as a rider is you can go, you know, you can be pretty hard on the brakes in the corners and uh, the bike's gonna save your butt. So it's a nice thing to have. Um, also in 2018, you started to see TFTs as an option. So for 2018 bikes, the TFT was an option uh, on the GS and the GSA. Now, another big change to the 2017, and these are all reasons, by the way, that I specifically bought a 2017 and a half when I was looking for a pre-owned GS. Um, they updated the transmission, so they finally did enough tweaking to the tranny that made it pretty smooth. It's not maybe like Suzuki level of smooth, but for a BMW, it's a pretty smooth tranny, especially for a BMW Boxer. So I, when I ride this bike, it doesn't feel clunky to me anymore like the, all the previous GSs did, so that was a big upgrade. Um, the things to watch for in this generation, I mean, if you're spending that much, unless you're getting a really, really good deal like I did, you might just want to consider getting a 1250. We're going to talk about why the 1250 is better. Um, so it's just kind of a trade-off. You're going to have to see what's right for you. But when you're getting that recent and spending that much, uh, look and see what you can get a used 1250 for. Okay, in 2019, uh, BMW evolved the GS once again. So in an effort to sort of chase the horsepower wars with the other manufacturers, they gave the engine something called shift cam. It's just variable valve timing. Now, there's some videos on YouTube out there right now that are kind of saying, well, it doesn't need this advanced technology and that's a liability. Um, that's a good point, but my point of view is that Variable valve timing is on like almost like all new cars now. Um, I kind of view it as something like when everything went to fuel injection. I mean, are we really complaining about changes like that? I don't think so. So I think it's a fine thing. I'm not worried about it personally. I found BMWs to be extremely durable, reliable, good, well-engineered bikes. So it doesn't really bother me that it has the shift cam, but you know, to each his own. Um, what the shift cam enabled them to do, along with bumping up the displacement a little bit, um, you get 11 more horsepower, but most importantly and most noticeably on the 1250 is the torque. The torque went up by 13 pound-feet, um, and you really, really feel it. I rode, uh, I've ridden um, this bike here back-to-back -back with the 1250, and there's a very noticeable difference, not just in how hard the bike pulls, but maybe even more importantly, how well it runs at low RPM. The, the 1250 really does well um, chugging along in a low RPM and it gives you power and torque right away with no kind of weird bucking or surging or, 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 or anything like that. Um, I honestly kind of regret not spending more and trying to find a 1250. I'm, I love my GS, how I have it set up, but you know, almost every day I'm thinking about, you know, I should have probably got a 1250. The other advantage of the 1250 is that the TFT display became standard. And the TFT, um, I've gone back and forth on this, but after living with my analog gauges and then riding the bikes with the TFT, the TFT is worth the money um, for the upgrade. It's, it's a great thing. And BMW has the best display in the business. Uh, the things to watch for is that the bike gained weight yet again. So unfortunately, I'm gonna put up the chart here for you, but unfortunately what's happening is they've, they're creeping the weight up and up and up every time they do these changes and additions. So if you look at the 2005 model, when they, when they cut the weight from the 1150 and they got it down below 500 pounds wet, and these are all wet weights by the way, that was 496 pounds wet. 
If you buy a, a standard, not, not an adventure, a standard 1250 GS today, it's 548 pounds wet. So that's, um, that's a 50 pound increase. Um, and that's a lot, that's a lot of weight. They need, to, they need to kind of get this in check. So if you're listening to BMW, when you update the GS again, try not to increase the weight and try to figure out some ways we can get, start getting this weight going the other direction. Because if we keep creeping up like this, it, it becomes a real problem for us to actually use the bikes off road. I hope this video has been useful for you if you're considering buying a used or even a new GS. My feeling is that when you're spending this much money on a motorcycle, you really should be informed about your purchase. What are the ups and downs of what you're buying and what are your choices if you're spending that much money? There's a ton of amazing adventure bikes you can buy right now for really good value, especially in the current situation that the world is in. I do tend to think that the GS has always been one of the strongest adventure bikes and there's a reason why it's so popular. I'm not saying other bikes are not as good because many of them are. Some of the advantages of buying a used GS is that the values tend to hold pretty well with the GSs. They don't depreciate too badly. And overall they tend to be really durable and pretty reliable motorcycles for the most part. Some of my ending advice would be really consider what your budget is and if you can stretch your budget a little bit to avoid some of those older bikes with some of those earlier issues, then that's probably a good idea. So I genuinely hope this was useful for you guys out there. If it is, please give the video a thumbs up. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Put in the comments any feedback or corrections you have to this information because I'm always open to that. And also give me suggestions on what other kind of videos you guys want to have. Until next time, ride safe. We'll see you out on the trail.